just culture and the role of leaders in fostering that just culture. And so I've been thinking about um, culture, patient safety culture, just culture, what that means, what that could look like for a number of years in my role here at the IWK, but also in my roles previous to that. So I, I'm really quite interested in culture and what makes culture good or not good and uh, where we should be going with this. So um, this, is, uh, this is the journey that the IWK is going to be embarking on. Uh, we have uh, just started the education and the implementation of some of this at the moment. So um, bear with me if you have questions that I may not be able to answer uh, from an outcomes or a fully implementation schedule uh, as, we, as this is uh, kind of new to us in the last uh, eight to nine months as well. So, and I will be stopping at a couple spots and just asking if there's any questions. So as Lisa said, feel free to type into the uh, text boxes. <clears throat> and uh, I have a bit of a cold, so if I cough, I'll just excuse myself for a moment. Um, so uh, what is a fair and just culture? And uh, what are we thinking about? And what am I meaning when I say that? So it really is a one that is fair, founded on justice and process improvement. It represents the balance between an open learning culture and the need to hold individual account of individuals accountable for the choices that they may consciously make. Organizations with a just culture appreciate that there is a need to recognize the difference between human error and that unintentional behaviors and what we talk about people being caught at the pointy end uh, versus the risky, the reckless, or malicious and deliberate behavior that people may choose to do. And a fair and just culture is trying to find that balance between the two of them. So um, in a fair and just culture, both the organization and its people are held accountable while focusing on the risks, the system's design, human behavior, and patient safety. So as most of you know, um, when we talked about just culture for patient safety, it was really adopted from the aviation field, and now it's embraced throughout private and public service. And healthcare is certainly one of the organizations that have embraced a fair and just culture. Healthcare uh, context can be applied to both from a corporate and a patient safety perspective. So up until about uh, eight or nine months ago, when we talked about a fair and just culture, we talked about it primarily from the patient safety uh, domain. And now we're trying to, uh, to link together or marry together the concepts of a just culture for patient safety and a corporate just culture together. So we looked at James Reason's work and the Swiss cheese model and how it depicts the latent failures, the psychological precursors, triggers and failures of system defenses and how when they line up, um, it results in an opportunity and a cause. So we we're trying to, um, we know now that patient safety and staff safety are more closely linked than one would have thought maybe a few years ago. So we're trying to link those concepts together. And many of you who are, who are involved in patient safety will know that you know one of the seminal uh, papers written on this was the IOM report from 1999 to Air as Human. And the aim of that report was really to establish patient safety as the major requirement of healthcare. Uh, shortly thereafter, the following year in 2000, an organization with a memory was, was published. And the aim of that was then to take healthcare and, and expand on how we can learn from other high risk and complex organizations. And so that was kind of the start of the patient safety movement. And then in Canada, the, the two seminal reports for us was the Canadian um, Patient Safety Adverse Events Study with uh, the incidence of adverse events among hospital, uh, hospitalized patients in Canada. And that was published in 2004. And then in 2010, the publication of the Canadian Patient Adverse Events Study, which CAFSI and many organizations on the call uh, was that uh, we're involved in. So those are kind of the, the, the groundbreaking works that set up patient safety um, in the U.S. and then in Canada. So when we looked at some of that work, we, you know, we, we swung the pendulum to be 
focused on system and process improvements. And now we're looking at, um, you, you know, kind of the broader spectrum of healthcare and acknowledging that incidents and errors do happen. And when they do happen, they can cause harm, including at every one of the organizations that are on the line today. And over 95% of the time, that harm is not due to incompetence, but to systems and process improvement, or process issues where there are inherent flaws or latent failures. And not speaking up or finding someone to blame will not eliminate those potential future harms, but will just perpetuate them. So what is the balance and what are we talking about when we're talking about a fair and just culture? So what it doesn't look like, or what we're saying it does not look like, is that it is not blameless. So up until um, you know recently, we would talk about the just culture for patient safety was nameless and blameless. And what we're saying now, it is not blameless, it is, but it is also not strictly punitive. It's not error free. It doesn't lack disclosure or transparency. And it is not about siloed learning. So what we're trying to build is what it does look like. It is about giving constructive feedback. It is about critically analyzing incidents when they happen. It is about focusing on the facts, respecting the complexity that uh, healthcare brings. It's about creating effective structures that help to eliminate those potential future uh, latent errors or failures. It's about learning and sharing. It's about a systems approach, but it is also about individual accountability. So the principles and the core beliefs of a fair and just culture as we're defining them um, are outlined here. And this aligns well with our values and our core beliefs of care and passion, excellence in leadership, and a work life and relationships. So some of the things that we built these on is that what are our core beliefs? And our core beliefs are that we all make mistakes and that we all drift. And when I say we all drift, what I'm referring to is the choices that we make that unknowingly create an unjustified um, thinking of that risk will fade. And so some of this is um, when we um, take shortcuts and they work 90% of the time, so we then come to believe that it's not risky to take that shortcut, and so the risk then fades. And that's what I'm talking about uh, when I talk about drift. And so we come, become comfortable with taking the shortcuts and feeling secure that it's not risky to take those shortcuts. Risk is everywhere in healthcare. We're all accountable for the, uh, the choices that we make. And a management needs to manage in support of the values that the organization holds. So the, what are the principles then that line up with those core beliefs? Is that uh, leadership must fo foster that culture of learning. So we have to be open and willing to share and learn. We must be open and fair. We must manage behavioral choices that align with our values and our principles. And we must design systems that are safe. So we have decided to um, use the word incident. And in the patient safety literature, there's certainly the, that we have moved away from adverse event and we've moved more into patient safety incident. And we're, we here are choosing to um, define the word incident to use it broad, broad across the organization. So it's be, when we talk about an incident, we are talking beyond a patient safety incident. We're talking about any event that involves patients, employees, physicians, or, or associates that require or triggers an analysis and management using a just culture lens. So um, some examples are HR incidents, patient safety incidents, intentional breach of policy or process incidents, et cetera, et cetera. So it goes beyond what we would report in our safety system of these incidents. Um, and it still may require reporting in the safety system, but it will not be limited to that. So that's the way we're defining um, incident here. <clears throat> so what's the difference as we moved from our 
blameless, shameless, nameless culture now into what we're calling our fair and just culture. What is different? Um, and what we're doing is uh, the puzzle pieces are, are lining up for choices that are made, as I said, versus systems. And so the accountability, so in addition to holding the system accountable for the system and process deficiencies, as I said, we're going to be holding uh, people responsible for their uh, behavior choices. While we are still continuing to have a blameless and shameless culture when the system or the process is, uh, you know, kind of at the root cause of what the incident was. Um, we're going to have apply a consistent set of principles and processes through a decision tree, which I will show you in a bit, for the analysis of incidents. And we're going to, while we're developing an open, a more open learning culture to share experiences and outcomes across the organization for system and process improvement. So uh, both the organization and its people will be held accountable, uh, focusing on risk, system design, human behavior, and patient safety. So uh, I'm just going to show one more slide, and then we'll stop and see if, it, if anybody has questions about what I've said so far. So we're looking at a fair and just culture versus a culture of blame. So before the patient safety movement came in, I would suggest, you know, in the 80s uh, um, and even into the 90s, we had a culture of blame in healthcare. So that's the red on the far right-hand side. It was a culture that was founded on blame and discipline of individuals and finding personal fault associated with the cause or incidents. And, you know, people were, uh, when something happened, it was because the person was uh, a bad person, my language. That, you're not going to find that in the literature. But we looked at personal flaws and personal faults. And then when, um, you know, the, the IOM report and then the organization with the memory came out, uh, we, the pendulum swung to a, really a no-blame culture. We looked for um, using events as opportunities to learn without assigning any personal blame. There were no accountability, uh, clear accountabilities implied. And, um, you know, people could virtually, you know, maybe intentionally not follow a policy or a procedure or make other intentional choices. And really, we were saying, well, OK, that's fine, but we're going to fix the system and process um, um, flaws. And then the people uh, issues were handled in another whole realm. And so what we're trying to do now is we're trying to bring back that balance to a fair and justice. And so a fair culture is founded on justice and process improvement. There's a balance between the open learning and the need to hold individual accountable uh, for their choices when providing care or de develop, delivering services. Um, and it also acknowledges that removing blame does not absolve individual or organizational accountability. So it really just uh, reassigns um, and holds the system accountable where uh, appropriate and it holds the, um, organize, uh, the person accountable for their own individual choices. So the reason we're moving to this and the outcomes is that uh, when you look at the literature, uh, going, moving towards a fair and just culture will provide more satisfied, engaged, and healthy workforce. You will have improved patient outcomes and reduced harm. You will have a consistent knowledge base, expectations, and principles and processes to apply. And it's going to integrate the patient safety and the corporate practices together. So I'll just stop there for a minute and see if there are any questions or uh, confusion that I created before I move on. So Lisa, are there any um, questions? No, I don't see anything written in just yet, but I'll just remind people um, to uh, they can write questions or comments into the into the pane in their control panel. I'm just uh, wondering myself. I've read a little bit about and sort of civility and sort of the importance of that in the workplace as it relates to patient safety. And you were talking about you know when you're talking about a fair and just culture and you know HR issues and things like that. Has that come up at all as part of you know what what um, represents a fair and just culture, sort of just sort of 
simple things like civility? A absolutely, and, and I'll get into that in just a minute. Oh, perfect. Okay, sorry. All right, so I'll keep uh, moving forward. So how do we apply a fair and just culture? And it, so it should complement your existing principles and practice within your organization. So as Lisa just mentioned, uh, um, civility, we have something here called the code of conduct and respectful workplace. Um, so those are, those are the expectations that we create and hold people accountable to. Um, and qual we have a quality review process, we have a reporting process. So here in Nova Scotia, we have some things that are legislative, some things are, that are positive, and some things that are exemplary um, that, that all feed into the fair and just culture that we're trying to create. So what some legislative policies are respectful workplace policies, our code white or violence in the workplace procedures, our joint occupational health and safety committee, uh, the department, our Department of Health and Wellness serious reportable events reporting policy, and then Bill Number 97 in Nova Scotia, which was enacted in May of last year, uh, which which is really our patient safety legislation and our patient safety act of of uh, committees we must have and how we must uh, process and uh, move forward with patient safety incidents. So those are things that organizations must have here in Nova Scotia and I'm sure they're very similar in other provinces. And so some of the positive things then that we have here that are not legislated is we also have a code of conduct that talks about expectations and civility as, as we move forward. We have professional standards of practice. We have a, a well-developed and mature quality review process. And in the last few years, we have been doing a lot of work in trauma-informed care. And I think that, that some of that work has even been presented at some CASI webinars in the past. And then some of the things that we have that are, are noted to be exemplary are our patient uh, bill of rights. And, and those are rights and responsibilities of patients. Um, standards for psychological health and safety in the workplace. We have a position statement on diversity, inclusion, and cultural competence. Um, so we have some of those things that are already um, built in. Uh, speaking up or reporting is one of the key components of a just culture. And everyone has responsibility to speak up and report. Um, and we have then have a responsibility to respond, to share, to educate, and to improve. Um, and in some cases, a responsibility to report externally. So we're trying to bring all of these together into um, you know, our model. And so as most people on the line may know about the LEADS framework in a caring environment, uh, we have also looked at what are the leadership behaviors that we expect moving forward in a fair and just culture, and then do they line up not only with our strategic directions, but also with the LEADS capability that we expect of healthcare leaders. So there's four um, leadership behaviors that are known within a fair and just culture. And one, the first one is embracing events as opportunities to address risk and learn from experience. And so how does that um, marry up with a LEADS capability? And obviously in the LEADS framework, there's lead self and system transformation. And we acknowledge that um, you know, the LEADS capabilities, we've just picked some examples here, but you could probably fit them in any of the uh, leadership domains within the uh, LEADS framework. The ability to coach, console, take remedial action, and communicate and openness, that would marry up with the LEADS engaging others. But it could also line up with, you know, developing coalitions, encouraging reporting of events, Again, in the LEADS capabilities, that would equate to uh, achieving results. And uh, timely feedback on reported issues, that could be developing coalitions, that could be systems transformation, that could fit into any of them. So it is really the leader's role to create a working environment for staff where they have a sense of that individual accountability, but also feel safe to voice their concerns, know how to do so, and be able to do so easily. It's important that the leaders uh, develop tools and other resources for staff so that staff understand the processes of, and the potential outcomes and what the expectations of moving to a fair and just culture are.
The Just Culture literature certainly highlights the importance of these four leadership behaviors in leaders. Um, and they're not new to us because, as I said, they would line up nicely with, uh, with uh, the LEADS framework in a caring environment. It's actually easy to connect the behaviors together under more than one capability, uh, but the message here is that really it's not new and it's what we are doing and it's just reframing it in a different way. So when you look at a fair and just culture and human behaviors, there are five uh, well-known uh, distinct uh, pockets or, or buckets that you could put them in. One is malicious behaviors. And as you, you move from left to right here, there is um, less uh, culpability and it moves more into uh, the system's design. Uh, so it's malicious behavior on the far left-hand side. And this is really the individual action where intent um, to cause harm and intent to do harm um, it plays into place. An example with this for this would be, and I know it's an extreme example, but it's, you know, if you had an employee that would sexually assault a patient, that would clearly fall into the Malicious Behaviors Act. Um, the next one is incapacity or impaired behaviors. And this is really impaired judgment. It's a medical condition that results in a person not being able to make the good decisions because of an underlying com medical problem, environmental factors, diets, drug or alcohol abuse. And an example of this would be an employee who has a medically pl proven substance abuse problem suffers a relapse, comes into work under the influence of alcohol or drugs, and forgets to provide medication to a patient. That would be an example of an incapacity or an impaired judgment. And although it's recognized as one of the human behaviors in a fair and just culture, that's not the one we would focus on. That would certainly be a, you know, a human resource and an occupational health. Um, they would have processes around that. So that's not where we're going to focus our energies um, because there are well processes uh, in, in place for that. And then the, the middle ground is the reckless behavior. This is behavioral choices to consciously disregard a substantial or unjustifiable risk. And an example of that would be um, if a life flight re uh, respiratory therapist or nurse decides to disregard the fatigue policy and accept the second flight without the proper rest in order to work an overtime shift. That is a conscious choice to disregard a policy that is put in place to uh, prevent risk from happening, i.e. being over fatigued when you're on missions, um, and making a conscious choice to disregard that policy to, in order to uh, you know, accept the gain of having an overtime shift. So that would be a conscious choice for reckless behavior. Uh, risky behavior would be a failure to exercise the skill, care, and learning expected of a reasonable, prudent health care provider, mistakenly believing that taking this risk is justified. It involves conscious deviation from known rules and expectations, but without the conscious intent to put someone at risk. So an example of this could be a protection services officer or a security officer who may fail to follow a proper, patient, uh, proper safety um, gear pr protocol, so putting on the proper safety uh, equipment required because of an urgent event that requires intervention and immediate response. Yes, it was risky behavior, and yes, it was done intentionally, but it was done not expecting a negative outcome to occur, but to intervene in a timely way to prevent a negative outcome from occurring. And then there's human error. And this the individual should have done something other than what they did, but it was unintentional action that caused or could have caused an undesirable outcome, whether because the planned action is not completed as intended or the wrong plan is used to achieve it. And an example of this would be when a, a nurse forgets to double check on administering pain medication, either because they were understaffed and there was not another nurse available there to help them, they were under high uh, workload demands, or there was constant inter disruption or interruptions, which created a lapse in memory versus a conscious choice to do that. So those are just some examples. We tried to use broad examples so that you could see um, 
many examples that it could happen at in, and it wasn't just about being a patient safety example. And now the next slide I'm going to show you is our fair and just decision-making tree. So it looks complicated, but it leads you into one of the five uh, behaviors. So I'm going to try and walk you through this, knowing that it might be a little bit difficult uh, to follow, but I'll try and walk you through it. So again, I said the incident um, in our context was any incident. So this is our decision-making uh, tree for incident analysis. Um, and we've uh, kind of divided up, so what is the investigation or analysis? Where does that leave you in terms of the deemed behavior? And what is the potential outcome that could happen as a result of this? So as I said, we've just started embarking on this. and, and uh, so we have educated our, all of our managers, uh, directors, and senior leaders on this. And we're in the process now of developing toolkits that will help support this. And we are going live next uh, Friday with our new um, safety, um, safety improvement and management system, our online reporting system. Uh, and so we have, the, as we've educated all staff, uh, we have educated staff on uh, appropriate um, components of just culture and expectations for them as well. So we're trying to build it into our current processes. So when you look at this decision-making tree, it's based on James Reason's uh, culpability model algorithm. And the cul culpability model or decision-making model, which are both widely used in quality, patient safety, and risk management, and we're trying to expand it. Uh, the model is used to, con uh, to determine culpability based on human factors versus system factors. And it helps to determine whether an event occurred because of individual accountability or because of system failure, which is also known as blameless uh, error. So reason uses a series of questions to explore why the event occurred and then to help you walk through the culpability of that um, decision. So the first set of questions is designed to determine if the resulting harm was deliberate, if the actions or the consequences were executed as intended, and the error would be deliberate and possibly criminal, depending what it is. If the answers to the questions determine that the actions were not executed as intended, um, the next test or culpable um, culpability is incapacity. So again, we're always going to be moving from left to right. So if you look at the start here arrow, um, the first question you were at, would ask is, were the individual's actions deliberate? If the answer to that is yes, then the next question is, were negative consequences, were there negative consequences either individually or organizationally intended? So was there intent to cause harm? If the answer to that is yes, then you are probably looking at malicious and deliberate harm. And so the, the, then the actions for the manager would be to consult with HR or the professional practice chief, uh, depending on um, the situation. And other options would be occupational health referral, referral to authorities or the regulatory body through the professional practice, letters of war warning or suspension, and formal discipline. So again, those are the options depending on what your review of the incident uh, showed. If when you ask the first question, were the individual's actions deliberate and they were not, you would then, or the second question, if the answers to that are no, then the next question would be, is there evidence of substance or cognitive impairment or severe psychological stressors? And if the answer to that is yes, is does the individual have a proven medical condition? And if the answer to that is yes, is there evidence that the individual took an unacceptable risk? If the answer to that is no, then you're probably going into impaired judgment or incapacity. And then in the green box there, it's actions for what, uh, what could happen in that situation. If the answer above, when you ask the first set of questions and the second set of questions was no, then your next third set of questions was, does the did the individual violate policy, procedures, or protocol? And if the answer to that is yes, is was the policy, procedure, or protocol known, 
understandable, and in use. And those are important is because you may have a protocol that's in draft form and it's not even known yet. Or you may have a protocol that is written in fetch jargon that it's not understandable. Or you may have a policy that's in draft, but it is in use. So if it was known, was understandable, and should have been in use, then were there significant mitigating consequences or circumstances? And some examples of that w would be, you know, was the policy a policy from 2001 that everybody knew was not best practice, and so everybody was violating that policy in order for best practice to occur? And then you would go to another trajectory. If the answer was no, that there were no mitigating factors, the policy should have been known, the policy was understandable, and the policy was in use and other people were using that policy, then you're probably talking about some reckless behavior. And the options, again, there are, you know, do we need to do some adjustments to their duties? Uh, uh, do we need improved supervision? Should there be training and coaching? Or is it formal discipline? And again, HR and professional practice are threaded throughout all of these for the manager to consult with. So if your answers to all of the first three sets were no, um, it would take you to the fourth stream, which, which is, did the individual make a risky or potentially unsafe choice? And if the answer to that is yes, then the next question were, would be, were there significant mitigating circumstances? And if the answer to that is no, they made a risky choice without any other circumstances, then the behavior was risky behavior. And again, you can see in the green box actions there. If the answers to all of this was no, it would lead you over to the, the, the far right-hand side, which is, was the individual working appropriately? and in other best interests, and or there were significant mitigating circumstances um, to the behavior that they did, then you're going to be led into that broader system issue requiring a, a review and where there would be unintentional behaviors or what we would call latent behaviors, and the person was caught at the pointy end of that trajectory, and the individual is not accountable, and you really need to look at your root causes of system processes and design. And what we would look at for some of this is the substitution test, or in uh, previous years we would have call a, called it the reasonable person test. So the substitution test is would another individual coming from the same professional group, possessing the same qualifications and experience, behave the same way in similar circumstances? And if the answer to that question is yes, then obviously it's a broader system issue. If the answer to that final question is no, and other people would have acted behave differently, then you're probably going back to risky behaviors again. So it, for us, it's worth highlighting that the broader system issues uh, will continue to be the focus of the work that we do in our root cause analysis. This will form the bulk of what we do, um, and we are always going to be looking for system and process opportunities to learn and redesign. Um, and we have our morbidity, occurrence, mortality committee set up to do that. And all of the other things that I talked about certainly are of a um, probably a lesser degree, a lesser occurrence, a more infrequent occurrence, but we wanted to acknowledge that they do happen and that there will be a fair and just process um, applied to those um, occurrences or incidents when they happen as well. So I'm going to take a breath there and stop there to see uh, we've covered a lot of information in a short amount of time and to see if there's any questions or concerns at this point. Uh, before I uh, finish up with the final few slides. Lisa, do we have anything? Well, actually, I think that you answered Tracy's questions because she said, have you incorporated any work related to fairness algorithm or the incident decision tree? So then I think that you've okay. covered that one now. So um, I don't know, if Tracy, if you had any other uh, comments uh, around that. Um, I have no other questions or comments at this time. Okay, perfect. So that either means that people are following me or totally confused people. <laughs> so when we look at the fair and just culture accountability for the IWK, we recognize that there's key players in supporting this 
um, all the way around. And each party has an important role in making it a live within the organization. From the board of directors to our executive leaders, the medical advisory committee, our director and physician co-leads, managers and their physician co-leads, supervisors, team leaders, so all staff, physicians, volunteers, HR, quality, system performance folks, and patients and families. So I'm just going to take a, the next few slides just kind of highlights what we have outlined as the expectations for each of these groups within this uh, fair and just culture journey. So at a, at a board level, um, we expect the board to hold us accountable to live fair and, our fair and just culture. Um, and to apply the fair and just culture principles to the board decisions and the actions that they take. So um, this isn't about just what happens um, below the board level. We expect this apply to, uh, to apply to board decisions as well. Our executive leadership team uh, were to learn and adopt fair and just culture principles and behaviors and consistently exhibit the leadership behaviors related to fair and just culture, and to work with directors and physicians to support the implementation of a just culture within their portfolio. The Medical Advisory Committee, again, learn and adopt, the learn and adopt uh, and consistently apply, you're going to see uh, throughout all of these. So learn and adopt the principles and behaviors and consistently exhibit the leadership behaviors related to a fair and just culture, and serve as a resource and a support to the other medical, dental, and scientific staff. So our medical advisory uh, committee is our leadership committee for our physicians uh, of both medical, dental, and scientific. Um, the directors and their physician co-leads are to learn and adopt the principles, consistently exhibit those leadership behaviors, and serve as a resource to support managers. And we recognize that at the managerial level is where the majority of this work will be occurring. And uh, they're to hold management accountable for fostering a fair and just culture for applying these principles as well. So the managers and supervisors, as I said, this is where um, kind of the work is going to happen. They need to learn and adopt the principles and behaviors. They need to exhibit these leadership behaviors. They need to encourage and expect the staff to speak up when incidents of any kind occur. They need to utilize just culture resources and the decision-making tool to assist in managing the incidents when they do occur. They need to serve as a resource to staff requiring support when they are involved in an incident. And they need to look for risks within teams and support smart and safe decisions. Um, and also, the, you know, we haven't really talked about, but we also need to be building high reliability principles into all of this. And one of the high reliability principles is that obsession with failure. So, you know, one of the manager's roles is to be obsessed with where can failure happen within my areas of responsibility and how can I upstream know about those and correct those so to help support my staff from falling into those latent failures. All staff, physicians, and volunteers need to learn and adopt the principles and behaviors. They need to support just culture within their colleagues and teams. They need to be accountable for the behavioral choices that they make within the workplace. They need to speak up and report incidents when they occur. And they need to make choices in alignment with the IWK's mission, vision, values, policies, and procedures. So staff are going to be, well, they are now, but staff are, you know, it's more overt of what staff are going to be held accountable for within a just, a fair and just culture framework. Human resources, quality, system performance, so the support roles, we need to uh, champion a fair and just culture within the organization. And again, for, with the reason that this is a little bit different is because um, Quality, patient safety, system performance, human resources, we're the ones who are developing the toolkits and rolling this out. So that's why we need to champion, uh, instead of learn and adopt, we are rolling it out. So we need to champion uh, this within the organization. We need to lead the integration of a fair and just culture principles into our existing policies and processes. We need to serve as a resource and support for leaders uh, at all levels and for staff. 
promote and support the fair and just culture of patient safety. That's a journey we were on since 2009, so we continue to support that journey while we support managers and others with the performance management actions required and the integration of just culture into all of our organizational standards. So we talked a lot about do we have a policy on fair and just culture? And when we did a benchmarking look at that, what we found is that organizations that have a policy that talks about fair and just culture, it really is about the disciplinary or the, the steps to, to take uh, when there's been breaches. And uh, so we decided not to go with a policy on a fair and just culture. We went with that decision-making framework, um, and we're going to embed the principles as we move forward into any policies, any protocols that are being developed, any HR processes, our, our all health processes, et cetera. And then patients and families' role is to help keep us accountable to providing a safer patient care experience here at the IWK. So their role is, is just to speak up with us, um, you know, whenever, whenever we need that to happen as well. So our next steps, because as I said, we're, uh, we're just embarked on this journey. We, we launched this actually in December is uh, our next steps are to embed the principles of a fair and just culture throughout policies, process, procedures, and ensure that there's integration into all of them. Uh, providing the education and training modules, and I gave you a brief snapshot of, of how we're doing that. Incorporating the, the principles of fair and just culture into any ongoing processes, our case reviews, our disciplinary processes for for staff in human resources, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and again, I said uh, we considered developing and implementing a policy, but I think we've moved away from that. Um, and we need to have communication and supportive tools and resources available, readily available for all levels of staff, and then providing that ongoing support for patient safety risk, quality, human resources, and our learning team. So that is the, the journey that uh, the IWK is on. And I'll turn it back to Lisa. I'm open to any questions. Uh, the presentation has been recorded, and uh, you can uh, refer to it at any time. And we can certainly look at uh, providing the individual slides to people over and above that if uh, you would like to have that done. So just a reminder for people to uh, type their questions or their comments into the uh, question pane. I don't have anything uh, new at this time, and uh, but I'm just wondering, are other organizations out there who's on the line, um, is this something that uh, you're working towards uh, in your organizations? Is it something, um, I mean, we've heard, we've heard that these terms, a fair and just culture, for a long time, and I think that over the years, organizations have said that they're working towards it or, or trying to achieve that, but, you know, in this sort of concerted way, I think that is uh, probably makes the difference when you have that uh, top-down approach that is like when the, the board and the senior leadership team say, no, this is what we're going to do. It, it probably makes a lot of difference. So I just was wondering if anybody out there has any experience with that in their organizations. But, um, and Lisa, am I still unmuted? You are open line, yep. Yeah. So uh, I'll just add one other thing. I know some uh, other organizations that we looked at, um, they're, they've defined a just culture as one of anonymous reporting. And we made an intentional decision not to go with anonymous reporting because you can pretty much figure out, uh, you know, you go to a chart, you can read things, you you know who's on shift. So we have gone intentionally with confidential reporting. And so we're doing work around that it is not anonymous, it is confidential. Others will not know this, but uh, we've made a conscious effort to, to do that and um, trying to build the safety and the open culture that people will feel free to speak up confidentially um, and so that we can do the follow-up and follow through and actually close the loop back with people that, um, you know, may be reporting us, specifically a patient safety incident as well. Yeah, that's a subtle but really important distinction, I think. 
So if we don't have any uh, comments or questions, or I can sort of go on to another topic as we're waiting for people to think of things or to uh, to uh, write things in, I just wanted to remind everybody of the CAFC uh, annual conference that's happening in Halifax uh, this October, the 23rd to the 25th, and our patient safety symposium will be on Sunday, October 23rd from 10.30 to 12.30. And we'll be focusing on reducing hospital harm. And we're really happy to announce that uh, CPSI, the Canadian Patient Safety Institute, and Solutions for Patient Safety will be there to share some of their initiatives, their successes, their stories, and their data. So I think it should be a very interesting time to see uh, um, and we'll listen to two different uh, two different. Um, countries' perspectives, and SPS is moving into Canada. We have a few SPS um, uh, Solutions for Patient Safety organizations here, so um, I think that we should get a lot of really great information from both of those presentations, and we hope uh, to have our um, registration up uh, today, so uh, if you want to be part of the early bird uh, registration, that, that goes actually, I think, till well into August. So you have some time, but uh, we welcome you all to the CAFC conference. And I also want to uh, announce that uh, the uh, CAFC's Patient Safety Collaborative is wrapping up its activities at the end of this month, at the end of June. But not to worry, though, we'll be back really soon, revitalized with a fresh plan. And our monthly webinar series will now be rolled into the very successful CAFC Presents webinar series, which runs every Wednesday. So we'll be able to reach a broader audience. And just so everybody knows, of course, patient safety remains a very high priority for the CAFC board and all of our members. And uh, we recognize how the patient safety movement has evolved, and we want to grow with it. So we'll be consulting with you, our, our members and partners, and we want to design a strategy that's going to better enable CAFC to support our member organizations in their patient safety improvement goals. So, uh, you know, over the years we've worked together to raise awareness of pediatric patient safety concerns and build resources and tools to aid in the implementation of best practices. And uh, if you're sort of new to our community or if you just need a refresher or reminder of all the things that we did, you can read more of our history uh, on the CAFC website uh, uh, about the Patient Safety Collaborative and you can view all of our archived webinars um, on our Knowledge Exchange Network. But I think our greatest achievement has really been to establish this network of dedicated patient safety experts and enthusiasts who are willing to talk and share and learn from each other. So we want to stay connected. Uh, we want to stay connected, and you can always uh, reach out to me or to our info at CAFC line and uh, bring, bring me your ideas for patient safety presentations, um, a new information that's coming out, new research. We want to share that. We want to still continue to share all of this information. And we want you to um, uh, continue to stay connected with us and receive information from us. So uh, we encourage you to uh, subscribe to updates from CAFC. And I'd also like to take a few minutes to thank all of the individuals who have chaired the, uh, our patient safety collaborative work over the years. So Darlene from the IWK, Tracy Rong, who was formerly from CHEO, Dr. Barb Brady Fryer, who was uh, from Stallery Children's Hospital, and Michelle Leahy, who back in the day it was called Capital Health. So, and I also want to thank each and every one of you. There's too many uh, people to name in the CAFC community. All of you have committed your time and your energy and uh, your dedication to improving patient safety for Canada's children and youth. So uh, please uh, remember we'll, we'll be back and uh, we're taking the hiatus for the summer. The Patient Safety Symposium will be in October and we will be uh, continuing patient safety uh, webinars, but they'll be on Wednesdays now. So have a great summer, everybody, and thank you for all your time. And I would just like to thank everybody that's on the line as well and has been supportive over the years. And it's been my pleasure to be the chair since, I think, 2000 and a long time. 2009, I think, I've been the chair mm -hmm. since. So um, it's been delightful. So have a great summer. And we will see people in Halifax in October. Thanks very much. Bye-bye now. Bye. -bye